So we're going to move along with, um, with our next speaker. It's my pleasure to present my colleague, Dr. Dan Sorescu. He's an associate professor at Emory. At Emory. He's been at Emory for quite some time now. Uh, he's, uh, he's part of our heart failure division in the cardiology division at Emory University Hospital Midtown. He's originally from Romania, um, where he received his medical degree. And then he did his internal medicine training in Beth Israel Medical Center in New York, where he subsequently moved to Atlanta to Emory to, to do his uh, cardiology fellowship on heart failure training. And he's been at Emory since then. He was, he, that was followed by a very successful, very well-published career. And he was a physician scientist. And his, his work um, focused on the role of oxidative stress in coronary artery disease. And um, he's been practicing heart failure at, our, at Emory University Hospital Midtown. He's been recognized as a best teacher several times by our fellows and, and medical residents. So welcome, Dan. Excited to listen to your talk about. He's going to be talking to us about these new agents, relatively new agents in diabetes, and now they are, are being, we're, they are being used in our field. So as GL2 inhibitors and GLP agonists in cardiovascular risk reduction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Um, so I was about to start with the disclosure slide, and I said I don't have any financial interest, but then I realized that actually I might do have a, a conf potential conflict of interest. It's been really recently recognized that actually when it comes to providing cardiovascular care, women are superior to men in that aspect. So I might, despite that, Carolina uh, uh, decided to invite me over here. I really... Uh, can say that probably, like Dr. Longberg has said, the best way to fix this, and we're trying to see how we can uh, really uh, improve our outcome data, particularly in women, well, just have more cardiology women and have more healthcare providers in a, from that side because uh, it does make a difference. Um, so when uh, I'm going to talk about, once I figure how we get this going. Okay, it's working. So, uh, this is cons what am I doing wrong? Okay. Um, these are considered new drugs, but they're not really new. Um, the SGL2 stands for sodium glucose uh, transporter 2 inhibitors, which is a transporter, the main transporter that uh, uh, basically uh, reabsorbs glucose in the, our kidney. Uh, so we preserve it in the body. And this was developed initially for diabetes about 20 years ago um, and was supposed to help a lot with diabetes. So uh, one of the things that happened is uh, because prior diabetes drugs actually have not been shown to be always cardiovascular friendly. As a matter of fact, if you remember, pioglitazone and some others have shown negative outcomes. It became a requirement from FDA to actually test, make sure they are safe in cardiovascular disease. So when we did that with this particular class of agents in the last 10 years, it turns out there are tremendous benefits from cardiovascular perspective. So what we did now, we do at least what we do all the time in heart failure world, you know, we steal the drugs from the others. And uh, it's been tested and over-tested, and I think it's going to be there at least until I retire. Uh, and it's important to really uh, get comfortable with it, and that's the purpose of this. Uh, uh, basically, I'm going to review the clinical trials with SGL2 inhibitors, mainly just because we have the most robust data, but also there's some evidence of GLP agonists. As cardiologists, uh, you'll have to be also uh, good with managing diabetes, and uh, I'm going to basically insist mostly on SGL2 inhibitors here, but I'll review at least the data of GLP-1 agonists. Then we'll try to see potential mechanisms. I mean, I think we got it right for the wrong reason. We don't really know exactly how they work, but at least I'm going to submit you some mechanisms that I think are going to turn to be uh, uh, real. And then really, of course, uh, I'm going to talk, I'll have to talk about heart failure and, and these agents, how it works. Particularly, they change a lot of guidelines and very, very fast. And it should be the clinical practice. Um, so. I don't know why. Obviously, I'm pushing the wrong button. Why is it just? OK, so um, uh, one caveat, diabetes, starting with that, 
It's a condition that we decided as physician to only treat it when you have hyperglycemia. I think it's a major system error here. And it should start with actually the development of insulin resistance. Uh, of course, at that time, most of the time, the fasting glucose may be normal or just borderline elevated. Uh, but believe it or not, that's when our microvascular complications start to develop. And at the insulin resistance level, we don't test for that. But just know that every clinical trial I'm going to present and everything we present is actually on the second more advanced stage where theoretically you already have cardiovascular disease. Ten years later of after insulin resistance, that's when we start to develop what we call now diabetes and outcome studies. But I think there's a problem there. So for those who do prevention, for those who want to think, I think we need to start and get rid of the word pre-diabetes. It's like you're going to call somebody pre-pregnant. You're the pregnant or you're not. <laughs> you really, so, yeah. I know it's not necessarily the best way of approaching it, but we know that actually anybody who had insulin resistance and had borderline elevated fasting glucose, uh, and we diagnosed them 10 years later with diabetes, oh, you had diabetes and actually end organ damage for the last 10 years. So obvious something is not right there. So that's important because if I want to then let me look at the efficacy of the drugs that we have in diabetes. You know, that might be one of the main reasons why we kind of failed miserably in the last 20, 30 years. We do have some data. So before I go into the fancy world, metformin compared to insulin has been studied in over 20 years long study in the in UK. And we know actually that reduces macro and microvascular complications. That's why it's in the diabetic ADA and AHA guidelines, the first line for insulin resistance. Uh, including that stage that I mentioned about, the pre-diabetes stage. Um, uh, GLP agonist, and not insulin, I'll show you the data. Uh, GLP-1 uh, one agonist, like, and these three are the main ones that actually have been approved in patients of diabetes and looking at cardiovascular outcomes, MACE, major adverse cardiac events, not male. <laughs> uh, reduce all cause mortality, stroke, and cardiovascular mortality, but actually it's extremely mild effect. You know, in average, anywhere between 13 to 25 percent, uh, but no effect on heart failure on myocardial infarction. As a matter of fact, the most effect impact is on stroke, uh, and that's important. Um, but last but not least, I'm going to talk about SGL2 inhibitors, which pretty much everywhere we look, we have evidence either for that looks just at the uh, Cardiovascular outcome, MACE, it's only mild maybe, about you know, an average of 20%. When we look at cardiovascular morbidity mortality, in particular heart failure, we go all the way up to 25, 30%. And when we look on the chronic kidney disease, independent of diabetes, uh, it's all the way up to 50, 30 to 50%. Tremendous impact. Uh, so, uh, and that effect is independent of the blood pressure, hemoglobin C, and lipid profile, although it does have impact on both blood pressure and hemoglobin one c So it's extremely important. Um, and I'm going to start with an old study. And just to remind, refresh by memory, we used insulin for, you know, uh, really 70, 80, 90 years. And now it becomes the main agent in patients with poorly controlled diabetes. But with type 2 diabetes, I'm not talking about type 1 diabetes. But we never thought too much about what's the impact on the actual cardiovascular outcomes and, and mortality. And, if there is anything, we actually have negative data about that. If the patient is mostly uses, we use mostly insulin to control their uh, sugar. Uh, actually, we have this Dagama study, which is post-MI. It's the only study. Anybody who had a heart attack were randomized to metformin, sulfonylureas, or insulin-based regimen. And uh, two years later, uh, we, to our surprise, uh, metformin appeared to be superior for some on the mortality. A lot of it was related to cancer-related mortality. But anybody who was on insulin ended up on insulin for two years, had twice worse risk of myocardial infarction or mortality. Uh, of course, this is an old, uh, old study, and, but we don't have any other study. Now we look at in different perspective, but just gives you a uh, perspective on that. Now, if we look more recent and at, at the newer agents like uh, glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist, uh, uh, we have about three of them that have shown some mild benefits, uh, about uh, 13 to 26 percent MACE reduction, mostly in strokes, as I said. So we have liraglutide, which probably is the best data we have, semaglutide, and uh, dulaglutide. Uh, and 
uh, but when it comes to uh, really MACE and also heart failure and overall cardiovascular mortality, the, uh, the SGL2 inhibitors seem to be, have much more profound impact, and this is just a uh, head-to-head -head kind of comparison. Um, so if I were to summarize, Weren't you supposed to just put on, push on this arrow? I don't know what I'm missing here. I've been doing this for about 25 years, and yet I get it wrong. <laughs> this button, right? It, it, uh, I push about 10 times to get one effect. All right. Part of it. Got it. Thank you. Um, so, um, metformin, we have two thumbs up. And uh, metformin is an interesting agent. Uh, I like it because it's still the cheapest agent we have for diabetes, but also uh, his, um, it works actually by fooling the liver that you did not eat, it's so always supposed to take it. So it makes the liver thinks you're fasting. And that's extremely important because what's diabetes type two? It's a gluttony state, it's exactly opposite. So we, it makes the body thinking you did not eat so it doesn't activate the mechanism of storing whatever you just ate. And that's important, and I think it's here to stay. Unfortunately, or fortunately, metformin's role in that is gonna probably be challenged. We have a nice study coming up. There are a couple of them with SGL2 inhibitors compared head to head with metformin. I hope that it's not gonna replace one or another. I think they both actually, I'll show you, work through the same mechanism. But keep in mind metformin, we have data. Insulin, we don't know if there's anything, we have negative outcomes. Now, obviously, somebody who's on, you know, has got a figure stick of 400, I'm not saying, you know, sugar 400, give them the insulin, but don't, doesn't mean we should take them off insulin then or treat them, but long term, try to do something that would make a difference. Uh, in terms of GLP-1 agonist and uh, receptor agonist, uh, we have two thumbs up, although mild effect on cardiovascular outcome, DPP-4 inhibitors, no difference, it just drops the sugar, nothing else, and it's very expensive. HGL-2 inhibitors, we have excellent data, I'm gonna go over. So, uh, to really, uh, sorry, now it goes too fast. To put this into perspective, and if I were to attack most of our patients who come, average BMI of patients who are in long-term trials I'm gonna show is 32, okay? That's morbid obesity. So just, let's, we gotta be very careful who we treat and what kind of conclusion we get there. So for that kind of patient, I think anybody who practices this nowadays will recognize that actually this is a condition that um, maybe it's oversimplified, but it shows you that when we overeat in Western type diet, processed food, snack, crackers, this combination of very high processed carbs, high processed meat, low fiber in the diet, it leads first to fatty liver. Actually, I'm going to propose to you there are three stages of the disease over 20, 30, 40 years. Fatty liver is the first one because fat, the liver senses the gluttony. After we get fatty liver, concomitant and, and soon after we get diabetic heart, which is actually where fatty liver sends signals to the rest of the body, you guys cannot store stuff like fat. Only me and the, and the, and the uh, fatty tissue can do that. Therefore, it sends insulin resistance to the heart, to the kidney, and to the brain. And that's where we get disease. Second stage is diabetic heart. Third stage is diabetic kidney. We start coming to the hospital, we have outcomes that we're interested in and start dying when we get to the kidney stage, but that's an advanced stage. I'm gonna show you data showing that actually SGL2 inhibitors affect all these three stages. We don't have so much for the fatty liver, we have only mechanistic study in, in mice, but definitely in diabetic heart and diabetic kidney. But remember, when, once we develop kidney disease, that's late stage, it's advanced disease. So it's very important. And uh, this, I'm just gonna, I don't know how you did it, but obviously I have some, there's some, yeah. I'm trying to blame it on it, yeah. So, um, so, what I, so when it comes to that, basically, there are now over 25 clinical trials with SGLT inhibitors cardiovascular disease. So I'm gonna, tr I try to make it in, uh, simple. The simplest way of doing this, if I told you that the kidney, the, the development of kidney disease is actually what drives the outcome and tells you the severity of a patient that was involved in it, 
Then I classify all these trials based on actually a, the, the, the presence of the, GF, the kidney disease, and particularly the GFR. And these are patients who are diabetics, who are at risk or they have advanced cardiovascular disease. Uh, the particular one, this one, the credence is actually a kidney study. Patient with CKD with microbinuria, clinical microbinuria, or even nephrotic syndrome, uh, who were randomized to one of these three agents, either uh, empaglyphosine, 10 milligrams. They did first 10 and also 25, turns out 10 does the job. So we're right now in practice, it's about 10 milligrams a day, once a day. Canaglyphosine, 100 once a day, or dapaglyphosine, start with five and move to 10 milligrams once a day. And if you were to stratify these patients where they were slightly different clinical uh, in terms of severity of the patients enrolled, they were slightly different, uh, mostly based on actually on their GFR. If you want to see the outcome of these patients and actually the benefit from the agents, you just need to look at the average baseline GFR and you can see that declared TME58, although it was one of the largest, actually was, had the lowest risk patient while the MPAREG had the highest risk patient uh, from the cardiovascular outcome data. When you look at the dedicated uh, uh, chronic kidney disease in diabetics patients, they had obvious an average GFR about 56%. So I'm gonna redistribute, and based on that, if I redistribute the outcome, it turns out that really the higher, the worse their baseline GFR, the more the benefit from the agents. Uh, which is telling you we're targeting this benefit from cardiovascular disease, mostly basic, basically improving the kidney disease in this patient. It also tells you they're more advanced stage two. Uh, so that's important, keep that in mind. The, you know, I, I say here there's a drug for, for cardiologists. It was really a drug for nephrologists, and they are learning that so quick. Now, at the first site, when you start to give this medicine, uh, you know, in the first actually couple of weeks, up to four weeks, it may drop a little bit the GFR. But don't worry about that. Actually, that's the mechanism of protection. We have the same data in heart failure when we started to use beta blockers. Initially, the, the uh, they get, the patients may get, once we put them better block and LV dysfunction, they may get a little more symptomatic, they may be a little more fatigued, tired, you give them a little time, the sudden they live much longer. It's the same way, because the way that works, it drops actually the GFR, it, kidney, uh, progressive kidney disease is actually a state of increased uh, kidney uh, feeling pressures, just like with heart failure. Actually, they have that in common. And if you reduce the cardiac and the kidney filling pressures, which is GFR, of course you're gonna drop the GFR temporary, but then on long term you save kidney and heart lives. And that's important mechanism. So don't worry, long term we have data showing that. And, and most recently actually the DAPA trial is dafaglyphosine on all comers with CKD, similar clinical albuminuria. You give them, independent if they have diabetes or not, if you give them and you look at the doubling in creatinine, need for dialysis and overall mortality, uh, in, uh, it was extremely superior, up to 40, 50% relative risk reduction. And that's including death from any cause. So it's very important and also tells us first time that actually, if I wanna look at cardiovascular outcome, I gotta look at the kidney related outcomes, because that's important for us. Uh, and speaks for the severity. And, and of course, the same thing, we, we notice the same, that. Uh, EGFR may drop initially in the first four to eight weeks, but eventually, on long term, you preserve GFR, if particularly if they have more advanced disease. All right, and should they practice more how to use this? Um, so to me, if I were to summarize, I got the, uh, the, the Type 2 diabetes in somebody who's morbidly obese with a BMI energy of 32 starts first with what we have here on the left side. Insulin resistance, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and really the main culprit is a fatty liver. Liver gets sick, and then we start to have cardiac outcomes. And you may start with heart failure with preserved ejection fracture or dilated cardiomyopathy, depending on your predisposition, your genetic predisposition, or other things you eat. And then eventually you get the other innocent bystanders that is a matter of time, everybody gets them. And some are more aggressive and not depending on what you eat or genetic background you have. Uh, and then in late stage, we get renal failure. That's where most of our clinical trials are focused in terms of hospitalization and mortality. But really, we're targeting these guys. We're not targeting here and here, all right? And I think that's what we have. And if we have evidence that SGL2 inhibitors can actually 
work on heart failure reactant outcomes, I'll show you data also independent of diabetes, work on coronary disease, although more modest, Actually, we have data that showing atrial fibrillation is reduced by 15, 20%. And the most important overwhelming impact is actually on progressive kidney disease once you develop it part of this condition. All right, so purpose is to just show you a vision and an idea that will just help you to focus when we start to interpret all these drugs, how we're gonna use them, for whom. So based on that, actually, the American Diabetes Association now recommends this. If you have diabetes type two, and this is diabetes, uh, you start first line with metformin. Uh, if you have concomitant cardiovascular uh, coronary disease, stroke, you name it, then a GLP-1 agonist is indicated also as GL2. One is not superior to another, although I think we have more data for SGL2 inhibitor. If the patient has predominant heart failure, go straight for SGL2 inhibitor. If the patient has renal disease, go straight for SGL2 inhibitor. So um, uh, in terms of the mechanistic insights, uh, we don't have really uh, uh, a lot of data about that. Well, the, presume, the presumed mechanism of working is that we lose, we block at this proximal tubule about the reabsorption about 50 to 75 grams of sugar. And um, that's equivalent of about 32 ounces of Fanta in a day, all right? And once you do that, you drop the sugar, it turns out this is not a, most of the time, this is not a hypoglycemic agent. Actually, the liver, once you lose that sugar, will actually make up for that missing sugar. That's why it's extremely, it's considered an extremely safe diabetic drug and that doesn't cause hypoglycemia. Now, we gotta be careful because in type one, if there are patients type one diabetic and on insulin, obvious that can happen because their, you know, their liver doesn't do that. Uh, because they need insulin, or if you have too much, so that's, uh, and then the second thing happens, every once in a while, I have patients who, uh, under, on the, they have the diabetes that's on the thin side, underweight. That means they don't have a lot of fatty liver stores, particularly women. I had a patient that actually literally had to, she started work eight hours a day standing up, and she started to be, she described to me hypoglycemic crisis, okay? She doesn't have diabetes. I took her off, suddenly all the symptoms went away. So it's not absolute, watch still for symptoms, even the patient's not diabetic because not everybody is able to respond to get that gluconeogenesis going, particularly if they are more on skin uh, thin side. Uh, having said that, uh, this is supposed to be the mechanism how this works. Uh, what we did notice is that in the heart, we don't have receptors for that SGL2. And of course, as cardiologists, our dogma is, well, you gotta have somehow change the cardiac remodeling. You gotta affect neural home activation. I don't know, one way or another, it has to hit on that. And indeed, we have some small studies, 100 patients looking at echo-based outcomes, where it shows that if you put them on empaglyphosine, uh, they actually do have reverse remodeling. The heart gets uh, smaller, you get less LVH, at least by data, diastolic function improves. So there's some stuff, but yet, we still cannot figure quite out why. Well, then we can go back to why did we steal this drug from the diabetes, uh, diabetologist and endocrinologist. And it turns out heart failure and diabetes, they're not very dissimilar, they're actually a lot alike. So it turns out the mechanisms that are activating diabetes are identically activated in heart failure progression. Uh, the agents that we use for, to treat the, the pathophysiology is both kidney disease progression in, in diabetes and heart failure progression, elevated feeling pressures, whether it's cardiac or kidney. You know, persistent hyperfiltration of the, uh, uh, with high GFR is part of the chronic kidney progression. And the agents that we use that we show actually mortality and outcome data are exactly the same. So, um, as a matter of fact, our thought leader in the field, Dr. Packer, who uh, I, I, I actually borrowed these slides from, uh, says that probably in these patients with type 2 diabetes, heart failure is the single most important, earliest, most preventable and treatable cardiovascular complication of type 2 diabetes. And uh, um, no wonder that actually heart failure was the most important outcome in these clinical trials. Now, as a, I used to do basic science, which we've been in the lab, Carolina, too, for a good 15 years. Uh, and. I have to think about, hold on a second, there's gotta be a mechanism how this works. Uh, unfortunately, what we know is that there is no receptor for SGL2 in the heart. 
But what we do have, actually, there is a receptor. There is a, turns out these uh, this, uh, drugs, they also bind to sodium hydrogen exchanger. Actually, it's been shown in human cardiac myocytes. It's been shown also in animal studies of heart attack or diabetes. And what is this side? You no, know, why am I introducing another, yet another term? It's another we've got to learn about that sodium globus transporter. But the sodium hydrogen exchanger, it's activated each time there is lactic acidosis. If you have a metabolism where you have excessive sugar, the overload of glucose in the cardiac myocyte or kidney actually causes acidosis because you, switch, you start switching to glycolysis and you bypass the mitochondria. That excessive lactic acid actually activates sodium hydrogen exchanger. Sodium hydrogen exchanger is activated not only in diabetes and in heart failure, but it's also increased and enhanced by exactly the drugs that we know are the worst in both conditions, which is insulin and angiotensin II. Uh, it basically, it's like in response to a sugar load, glucose load, the cells try to protect themselves by adding a uh, sodium overload, and they're both osmotic active substances. Uh, but it turns out it's actually, once you activate the sodium in the heart and in the kidney, then the heart has to protect sodium is osmotic active particle, right? So you attract water if you get more sodium because you activate this channel. And then what happens is every cell will have counteracting mechanisms. Oh, we gotta get rid of the sodium. So you activate sodium calcium exchanger. In exchange, then you have a chronic increase of calcium concentration in every cell, cardiac myocyte, neurons, retina, you name it. There is actually in charge of progression, whether it's heart failure or cardiovascular disease. So this chronic elevation of calcium, together with angiotensin activation, thinks that we're dealing with a low oxygen condition and high glucose conditions that's typical for a fetal heart. Fetal tissues have the most explosive growth in a setting of extremely low oxygen and low glucose. It's a paradox, right? You don't have enough food, but yet you grow the most when we are, have, are the most. Yeah. And but that, why? Because we're adapted for it, and that's why angiotensin to that in that fetal life does grow our uh, cardiovascular and kidney tissues. Unfortunately, this mechanism activates in adults, causes a fetal phenotype switch, but also in, in the kidney that actually is deleterious. So blocking this channel early is like suddenly the heart does not see and the kidney cannot see that you actually have angiotensin activation, you actually have hypoglycemia. And actually this could be part of, of the uh, of the true mechanism how this works and provides the cardiovascular protection. Now, there is, if there are hemodynamic effects. Uh, uh, because you have a mild diuretic effect, you excrete both sodium and glucose in the urine, you attract the water, it reduces, it causes mild diuresis, you, you, uh, uh, you reduce your afterload, you reduce your preload, blood pressure goes down about, you lose in average about five pounds, uh, uh, sometimes fluid, sometimes weight over the next a month or two after you start, but also the blood pressure may drop by about three to four millimeters mercury. Now, everybody who knows cardiovascular outcome trials, there is absolutely no correlation whatsoever between how, imp how significant the impact is and uh, the minimal reduction in the blood pressure or, uh, uh, or actually uh, diuretic effect. Uh, so actually, these are the most hypothesized currently mechanisms. One of them is what I was telling you about, both um, when you block these channels, the sodium channels and the glucose channels, whether it's in the heart and the kidney, the, suddenly the, that glucose overload is coming in the kidney cells to reabsorb or in the heart is gone. So the cell has a time to actually fast and relax. Remember, we, our cardiac myocytes, our kidneys or our cells, they eat mostly after we eat and then the rest, the rest of the glucose production is supposed to be provided at a steady low level, particularly in fasting overnight, by a constant low level pro glucose production from the liver. So actually inducing this fasting state can help actually for the heart and the kidney to recover. And by the way, this is the same mechanism how metformin works. It activates a cytokine by AMP kinase, and I told you, induces the fasting state. The other one is I, pro I provide you a mechanism that probably sodium hydrogen exchanger could be involved. And there are also what we call remodeling effect. The heart and the kidneys are uh, uh, not only that you have hemodynamics in fact, but also we know, at least in animal study, it prevents inflammation, fibrosis, and, and, and uh, at the pathological level. 
Now, kidney, those are the cardiac effects. In terms of the kidney, you have a, uh, you block your sodium and glucose reabsorption. But it turns out when you do that here in the proximal tubule, the excessive sodium and glucose delivery to the macula densa, it fools the kidney to say, you know what, you don't need to reabsorb all this back. We don't need it anymore. And it reestablishes what we call a tubular glomerular reflux that actually has lost a long time in patients with heart failure and, and kidneys and turns off the angiotensin. It's the only diuretic that will actually lose sodium and glucose in the urine without activating angiotensin in the kidney, which is actually the main uh, way how diuretics damage the heart and the kidney. So keep that in mind. And what happens is you reestablish, once you establish the natural healthy tubular glomerular reflux that works in anybody healthy, then you have actually adenosine released from here that will vasoconstrict your afferent arterioli and reduces the glomerular pressure. Glomerular pressure. So that's one potential mechanism that's in there. Other, other effects that we learned in the last 10 years, actually, yes, drops the hemoglobin C, but a little bit, 0.5%. So it's not a major, if you just look at that in a uh, you know, uh, diabetic drug. It helps to lose weight about five to 10 pounds, drops for the three to four millimeters blood pressure, all these good afterload and preload effects. Helps with the plasma uric. Not many diuretics actually don't cause gout. And reduces this glomerular hyperfiltration as the main mechanism how presumably progress to chronic kidney disease according to nephrologists. So these are all beneficial effects. There's one more, and to our surprise, it also helps increase erythropoietin, okay? which may be something that it's uh, actually positive effect in particular in our patients with heart failure and correct uh, anemia related to heart failure. Um, so diuretic effect, uh, when we study this, it turns out it's not causing as much, a regular diuretic will cause both intravascular, deplete, uh, intravascular volume reduction but also interstitial one. While uh, the SGL2 seem to not have minimal impact in, the, in terms of intravascular volume, you can get orthostatic hypotension if they're concomitant on high dose diuretic. So if we ever decide to start this, and I'm careful, I usually cut in half my dose of diuretic or I reduce the frequency because you should expect some, uh, some synergistic diuretic effect. By itself, if they're only on this one, doesn't really do much. But if you have also patients like me who see, uh, with heart failure, you got a problem there, make sure we reduce that. So that's one uh, possible beneficial effect as a diuretic. Uh, the second, uh, and the second the most important beneficial effect is actually that long-term reduces this inter hyperfiltration, glomerular hyperfiltration. This is obviously a subject for, for the kidney doctors, but if you combine that with, and all these clinical trials is very important, we're done where the patient, whether it's heart failure or kidney disease, they're already on perfect RAS blockade. So they were on angiotensin, uh, either angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, uh, were uh, 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 entresto-like agents or ARBs. So together they're actually synergistic, together they block the uh, they prevent the, uh, uh, the negative side effects of the archivillains here uh, in angiotensin and insulin, which are the main drivers of progression of diabetes and, 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 uh, and uh, heart failure, uh, whether it's the kidney or the heart. Uh, more recently, actually, we have some data that another agent that actually blocks this sodium hydrogen exchanger is three in the kidney and is number one in the heart is actually mineral or receptor uh, corticoid an uh, antagonist like phenarenone. And actually we have data on progressive kidney disease now showing that it's, it's uh, not as strong as SGL2 inhibitors. You remember it just blocks the sodium hydrogen exchanger. It's SGL2 inhibitor also blocks the sodium glucose exchanger. But it is there, proves at least the hypothesis, some of the effects of the SGL2 inhibitors are mediated probably through sodium hydrogen exchanger. And mineral corticoids do that. So last but not least, I'm gonna talk about the impact of these medicines, not just in diabetes and cardiovascular disease, but actually independent diabetes in heart failure. Uh, we have had actually major heart failure guidelines update in the last six months about that. So if I were to summarize, okay, how about heart failure and diabetic drugs, what do we know? Uh, it's not too clear, metformin may or may not, there are some data showing metformin may help, or, uh, but it's not too clear. It does activate, I was telling you, the fasting 
makes the cells thinking they're fasting, particularly in this kind of gluten stuff. Sulfonylureas are not good. Insulin and thiolizone, and we all know Avandia, pioglitazone, Actos, not good for heart failure. Uh, they activate actually this sodium hydrogen exchanger, which we know is bad for you. GLP-1 receptor antagonist, uh, there are two kinds of the good and the bad. The good, it does protect coronaries, okay, and, and, and peripheral vascular disease and, and strokes. But when it comes to heart failure, activate the cycling EMP, and actually that's bad for heart failure progression. So we kind of ambi have ambivalent data there. DPP-4 inhibitors, I mentioned, they're extremely expensive and they drop the hemoglobin C by 0.5 to 1%, but they do nothing else. Um, and uh, they actually can make worse the heart failure. We have some two small trials with negative data. Now, HGL2 inhibitors are really, right now, the best approved for heart failure, and let me show you some data. So in one of these studies, the declared TME53, what they notice is, to their surprise, they were trying to see, make sure they are safe for heart. It turns out they will improve uh, uh, mortality and particular heart failure related admissions. And if the patient had already some kind of heart failure, suddenly dramatic effect. If they didn't have heart failure, it wasn't too clear. So then they came up with the idea, well, why don't we just test this dapaglifen and GL2 on all heart failure, uh, in, independent of whether they have diabetes or not. And this was basically what tested in the DAPA trial, which was a tremendous uh, surprise because uh, Probably ever since beta blockers like Carvelor and Metropolo haven't seen this kind of impact on heart failure outcomes. Uh, this is the truth. Uh, yes, and Tresto and the newer ones are a little bit, it's incremental, but the beta blockers and this probably compare the most in terms of, so suddenly we have a, uh, these patients were followed, dapaglavopo, ejection fractions in 40%, prior hospitalization, followed for at least, you know, uh, here uh, about two years. Uh, and uh, not only do you have about 20-25% improvement in either heart failure admissions, uh, death from cardiovascular disease, or death from any cause, okay, uh, but also the curves start to separate within four weeks of starting this. Four weeks, big difference. Uh, just to have a reference point, beta blockers about, uh, takes about the same way, four to six weeks. Um, the um, Arnis or entresto like agents, about eight weeks. Spironolactone, about three to six months. And um, hydrolase and nitrates, uh, about a year. So it's a big difference. And if you were to look then, what we call necessary number to treat, which is this is how we assess ourselves, how good are we doing if we're gonna implement this on each and every one. Uh, really, necessary number three, 20, is actually superior to ACE inhibitors. Uh, it's close to beta blockers, which is are in the seven to 10 range, and it's similar to interest like agents. And when it comes, that's in, when it comes to cumulative heart failure admission and death, when it comes to actual death, it's 50 to one, which is excellent. So either way, uh, this was uh, a very pleasant surprise. And when we look uh, in subgroup analysis, the greatest impact appeared to be on those patients who I told you, have the worst kidneys, all right? Doesn't mean it's all explained that, by that, but it also tells you that it does work both on the kidney and the heart, and it protects the heart and the kidneys. That's why I tell my patients. Although we may not know exactly yet how it works, we know they are safe, and we know they protect both the heart and the kidney. So now we have studies, diabetes or no diabetes, heart failure or just cardiovascular outcomes. Kidney disease, independent or with presence of diabetes, the same numbers. In average, 25, 30% relative risk reduction everywhere you look at, okay? Um, and, ah, I didn't do anything. <laughs> there is something wrong in the interaction between this and me. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, it, like I had the memory that I pushed about 100 times about five minutes ago. All right, uh, I got 10 more minutes and at least I got a good joke out of this. All right, so um, I think I was at the half path level. Yes, no, oh, well, five minutes, got it, okay. 
we have our, so that was C-story core failure, all comers, and really now we have evidence for all three agents, it doesn't matter which one. It's considered a class effect, it doesn't matter if the EF ejection fraction less than 40%, uh, it doesn't matter if they have diabetes or not, it doesn't matter which agent you use, find the one that actually a uh, patient can tolerate from financial perspective, and they, it works. Uh, what about HEFPEF? And in this, uh, the only main trial we have is the uh, Emperor uh, Preserve with empaglyphosine 10 milligrams once a day. Uh, and uh, it was, the HEFPEF was defined originally here as an ejection fraction of more than 40%. I actually included those mid-range, which is 40 to 50%, which is a novelty. But it turns out that if you combine cardiovascular uh, heart failure admissions and the cardiovascular mortality, then we did reach uh, the outcome. And it's important because it turns out only 80, only 20% of these patients who were, invo who were uh, involved in, in trial actually came in the hospital, admitted with HEFPEF because of heart failure. Actually, they had other reasons why they were admitted in the hospital. So you, you miss 80% already. You only have 20% why you're admitted for heart failure. And even with that, was able to actually reach statistical significance. So it's a strong signal, and it starts as early as four weeks, just like the other. So if I were to summarize this, is that it's good for your diabetes, it's good for your cardiovascular or MACE kind of thing, it's good for systolic heart failure independent of diabetes, is good, it's tremendously good for anybody with chronic kidney disease. As long as GFR is over 25, uh, it's anywhere between 20% for dapaglyphosine all the way up to 30% for canaglyphosine. But you have a quite wide range of GFR, and we all feel comfortable with, you know, with most, we'll cover a lot of our patients with a GFR at least 20, 25%. And we're still waiting for pure mortality data related to HEPF. However, hospitalization is extremely important uh, as overall outcome. So basically, this is actually Dr. DeFranz, the one who invented this class of medicine over 20 years ago, it meant to just help with diabetes, but also warning us that it's actually a safe drug, not just for uh, diabetic, uh, diabetologists, but also for cardiologists, primary care physicians, and nephrologists. And if I were to implement this in the practice, uh, there were, okay, what are the side effects? We know now these are good things. The side effects are, number one is cost. And hopefully, we'll get more and more approved. But if you don't have insurance, it's six to $800 a month. If you do have insurance, your copay can vary. If it's approved at two or three weeks, a lot of stuff having to work on that. Uh, anywhere between 40 to 80 or $100 copay. Hopefully, that will get better with time. One to two percent will get actually fungal infections, you know, uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, genital, and it could be a limiting factor. In general, I notice patients who have poorly controlled diabetes, so we would have been my first line on somebody who just had a recent urinary tract infection or their sugar is not really well controlled. But, and I would, I'll caution with that, because you don't want UTAs or some other things. But short of that, you know, there are not many really side effects other than cost. And you can pick whatever agent you want. You have actually a GFR that for dapaglyphosine, you can start with 25%, 20, uh, 20 for uh, empaglyphosine, 30 for canaglyphosine. Uh, as I said, when careful in patients who have poorly controlled diabetics in the hospital, that's not, I don't start in the hospital. I try to fix their sugar, get the recent level first. You have to pay attention if they have heart failure. They are on kind of diuretic. You will need to reduce your loop diuretic, uh, either frequency or dose. Just keep an eye on that. And I do check orthostatic for orthostatic hypotension, particularly if I have to use a loop diuretic so I can step back on it. And really, renal function maybe once every one, three months. Don't worry if the GFR drops by 10% in the first month or two. What it matters is after that. Okay, I hope this is useful. Now, heart failure wise, if I were to add my four pillars of ARNI, beta block, MRA, and SGL2 inhibitors on every patient with ejection fracture less than 40%, then I have a 73% outcome reduction. This is extremely important because the patient, when they see them first time, they ask, how long am I gonna lead, doctor? Well, this is what it is. It depends what you're gonna do. I'm gonna put you on a lot of drugs and there are gonna be some of them expensive. But if I can get you on that, you get an average six years of life gain. That's what you need for you. Now, this is 40 years of research in heart failure clinical trials. And you have an, you know, Three out of four, almost, will survive this, provided we can get them to a proper, obvious, you know, you gotta work with lifestyle changes and everything else. Now, this is a big discovery for heart failure, and then we got to this. 
but of course, there's a difference between evidence-based medicine and implementation of evidence-based medicine. Too often, more often than not, we only are effective about, at most, 50% that we get them there. Now, as heart failure physician, if you were to look in my clinic, maybe only 50% of patients, we might be some of the worst culprit in heart failure, but, but that's a referral bias. We just get the most advanced, and we know advanced heart failure, one of the criteria for advanced heart failure is actually intolerance to ACE inhibitor beta blockers and all that stuff. But don't be fooled by that. The point is, whoever tolerates, try to make an effort because it makes a difference. So AHA and, and you know, this is December guidelines. And I saw these beautiful schemes, five small little letters, it's great. It was terrible, the AHA guideline in, 2000, in December 2021. And the reason why it was terrible, although they introduced that you should use it, it was recommended you should do one step at a time. It's like when you dress up, first you put the pants, then you add this, then you add that. And I think one of the problems with AHA guidelines in that perspective, when we moved away when it comes to hypertension medicine, we learned that if you have different agents works on different classes, start them all at once and lower those, it's way more powerful, more likely you're gonna get them there than to do one at a time. Just like we learned with JNC guidelines that we are updated. So, but bottom line is now, that we figure there's a discrepancy in, uh, between what we should do and what we're doing and how come a year later, okay, this is the actual data when you try to apply that kind of strategy. Only one in four patients will die or get hospitalized within 30 days, okay? One in four, well, I just promise you the world there should be, you know, one in 20, you know, one in, no, you multiply four by uh, times uh, three, 12. It should be only one in 12. Uh, one in three are still not on beta blockers. Two in three are not on MRA. Uh, one in two, not on ACE inhibitors. Five in six are not on ARNIs. Okay, beta blockers, in the, in the same time we have the data of the opposite. By the way, if you were to make a bet, I separate this group in women and men, which one do you think is gonna do worse? Absolutely, absolutely. I don't know what's the deal. Women are fantastic caregivers. You give them a hey, a, a rat to take care of it. They're gonna take it to the vet, they'll do everything for that rat, okay? I'm exaggerating, usually it's a dog or a cat, but you give that, but you tell them to take care of themselves and put all that energy for themselves. It's extremely difficult. So I learned as opposed to men is on and off. Either you convince them to do it or they won't. With women, it's a every visit fight where they're gonna take the medicine, they're gonna take care of themselves, they're gonna reserve one hour for themselves a day to take, change the lifestyle. And yes, that is a major blockage to implementation of that. So we need to focus on that and understand that. But beta blockers improve, our knee on top of MRI improve the EF, so I try to bait them. Hey, do you want your, let me tell you about the ejection fraction. I tell them, well, if I can use this drug on you and you are consistent about it, but it takes at least three months, then I can get that number ejection, because they like, everybody likes numbers. What's my ejection fraction? And it's a good thing to how you can bait everybody with that. Uh, but I learned ladies like more than men that number. So we get that, and then I tell them, hey, I'm good with better block, let's work on the arnis, and I, we can try this. Now I might have a little more dizziness, just let me know, I'm sure I'm gonna make it working. But if you don't start them in the hospital, it's also the speed of how we implement this is extremely important, because if you don't start them in the hospital, any of this, your risk of actually not being on anything is about three out of four. We do exactly opposite. So uh, basically now, yeah, finally, a great update from AHA heart failure guidelines in, in, in February. Uh, we actually, our father, one of ours being Dr. Butler, used to be here in, in, uh, at Emory, is that, you know what, you don't need to do one at a time. Just pick, you know, anyone, any regimen you're familiar with. You, if you have a list of blood pressure of 110, you can start with Arnie and better block. I prefer first the beta blocker because it still gives you the biggest bunk and it's the best tolerated. We still have the most evidence in terms of survival and injection fraction. Then, and uh, you know, depending on the blood pressure, you can pick a core if it's alpha block and you have high blood pressure, or you can pick uh, non more of selective beta one antagonists like bisoprolol, and metoprolol, and that's super safe and tolerate as long as ejection fraction is not really like low, 10%. Careful, who doesn't tolerate beta blocker? Advanced RV dysfunction or significant valvular disease, VRMR, severe TR, 
you got a problem they're not going to tolerate. So I'm going to be more cautious when I do this than I um, be, as long as I have blood pressure, then I'd rather start with Arnie, or of course lysinopy if they cannot afford. Mineral receptor and antagonist, it's almost no blood pressure problem, no side effects, except you gotta check creatine and potassium in two weeks. HGL2 inhibitor, pretty much you can start on anybody. Uh, and, why, and then in, next, in two weeks, this is in the hospital, and then you see them in clinic within a week or two weeks, and then you can titrate your two main drugs, beta blocker and Arnie, and then you can get very close. I get most of my patients to the target dose within four weeks. And while we're doing that, look, these are, as soon as you start on that, within four to 12 weeks, you have already mortality and ejection fraction benefit. And most importantly, they stop coming to the hospital. All right, so these are important. Time is important. Try to get comfortable, both the doctor and the patient. I use a lot of telemedicine visits for titrating my medicines for this. I select them, I have my Thursday afternoon block just for this. And it's wonderful, actually patients appreciate it. Of course, you gotta keep consulting them and keep giving them advice and encourage them, hey, begin my DVDs, check your blood pressure, let me know. But this is a good way of you know, squeezing in more patients and being able to titrate faster the drugs. Uh, and now we know that we have robust effect in reducing hospitalization and just remember, kidney and heart protection, particularly heart failure admissions and all uh, cardiovascular death in those with heart failure. Uh, now, I sub uh, although we think it works mostly by excreting sodium and glucose, remember, it's sodium and glucose together. Our kidney, our heart sees, never sees sodium and glucose separate. It sees them together. That's how we have the channels and the receptors. That's why it makes no sense to me why we focus on reduce your sodium intake if you have di a heart failure, reduce your glucose intake if you have diabetes. No, you reduce both of them. As a matter of fact, the number one cause of sodium retention is actually uh, 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 in patients with heart failure is actually in high blood pressure is actually a hypoglycemic diet. Actually, the more sugar you eat, the higher, more processed carbs, the higher is your blood pressure almost independent of sodium. So both of them matter because that's how they are processed. And that's why it made this impact, I think. Uh, and um, I'm supposed to, okay, so I'm at the question level. Do we have time? No, we're good. Uh, I'll be happy to share the presentation. This did it to me.